What is up, everybody? Welcome to the 585 Report. Uh, Mitch Broder with my co-host, Ryan, who is on summer break, celebrating his first day with uh, some podcasting today. I'm sure that feels good to no longer have to, uh, you know, go into work and I'm sure deal with, with the kids and everything. You're you're a free man, Ryan, for the next uh, couple of months here. Yep, I got I got two like two and a half months off. Uh, like Judge said, when he had him with had him with us uh, last week, summers are very much part of the reason uh, teaching is so great. So I woke up, I still haven't showered yet. That's why when you see this on YouTube, my hair is a mess. And uh, but. It's great. It's 10 a.m. I'm podcasting. Got to sleep in today. Can't really uh, complain about anything. Yeah, it sounds good to me. I mean, I, I, that that summer break is uh, certainly not one that uh, certainly sounds real good for sure. Um, so we did something kind of different for this episode, I'm sure, as our followers uh, saw on Twitter. But instead of us kind of coming up with things to talk about, we wanted to know what you guys wanted us to talk about. So we put out you know, a tweet asking for essentially fan mail and we got a couple of really good entries and some of these questions ryan are really interesting um, and, and and i want to definitely give some credit real quick to our listeners for coming up with these great questions um but ryan i think we should uh get right into the first one i don't want to take up uh too much time me blabbering here but we're gonna go right with the first one here it's from chris f and he asked us who on the roster has the biggest upside and improvement from last year to this year and conversely who is the most likely to disappoint in 2021 so ryan i'll start with you basically who's who's making a big jump this year and who's who's regressing uh this year as well i'll start with my upside we can kind of do this in two parts here my upside compared to 2021 our computer 2020 is ed oliver i think ed oliver has flashed too many great reps on tape i think he has too much physical ability to not be a great defensive tackle and you look at some of the great defensive tackles in the league through their first two years i i posted some the other day where i compared him i I looked at cam hayward's first two years his first two years and they're similar in terms of production you know it's hard when you're an undersized defensive tackle who played in a smaller conference to come in and sometimes produce right away especially when you take away a guy like star and you have to take on some of those more double teams but when you go back and you check the tape he finds ways to disrupt plays that and he's just not quite finishing from time to time but even without that some of the some of the more untraditional stats like pressure stats and and um he's getting he he's producing in those regards so i think year three is where i see him start to put everything together especially with a guy like star back and um and really become a dominant game-changing defensive tackle yeah, I, I like that. I mean, Ed Oliver is someone who I know people, you know, fans are starting to get impatient with, but I, I think that the ability is so there. And again, we're, we're going to see what, you know, with Star Lutuli back in the mix, he can play more of that natural three tech position. I know people are saying, well, you know, he should be good enough to, to bust double teams, but, you know, he's already undersized as it is. And his game's all about speed, quickness, you know, exposing one on one matchups. And I, I don't think fans kind of understand the one tech role is just to clog things up and free up other guys and ed's not really that kind of a player he can do it he did it for you know houston he did it last year for the bills but i think in his natural three tech position i agree uh, i really think he could uh, really explode i'm gonna go with zach moss for my guy who i think is gonna be uh you know big upside he you know he was injured a lot as a rookie it just never felt like uh for most of the year he was really comfortable but at the end of the season we started to kind of see the player We thought the Bills were getting. He was decisive. He was running hard. And I think that with a year under his belt, with a a full offseason, I want to stress that. I don't think people understand how hard that was for these rookies to come in with no offseason. I think that he could be a player who has a real big role in this offense and could finally start to really, you know, show some consistency, uh, you know, which is something the Bills backfield just really desperately needs. I really like that pick too. Zach Moss. And I think the game we really start to see or saw where what the Bills wanted him to be was that Pittsburgh game where the Bills ran out the clock for seven minutes on his back. And you saw what a back like that can do when you're at the end of the game and guys are tired 
and guys don't want to tackle and just the spark that he brings. And I have him going into last year as a guy who could be running back one. I know we really don't do running back ones for the Bills, but I think that 1A guy, once he's back and healthy, and I, I think he's a really unique talent. You know, once again, not that home run hitter, but I just think a guy that you can run between the tackles in a way that you can't really do with Devin Singletary or Matt Breida and, you know, a little bit more pass catcher, a little bit more better of a guy in pass protection. So I, I really like Zach Moss for that. Now, for my disappointing, and, and I want to preface this because he's a popular player, and I want to kind of define what I mean by disappointing. Not meaning that he's not going to produce at the same level as he did in 2020. Not meaning that he is going to be bad. I mean a guy who I think fans are putting a lot of stock in is a guy who's going to be a lot better when I think he's just, I think he's pretty close to his ceiling as it is. And I'm going with Gabe Davis. And once again, Gabe Davis had a great year with what he was asked to do. He played that X receiver who who could utilize that long speed on some of that deep stuff. He played that pie in the power slot quasi tight end role where he could come and crack back on running plays and could come back and, you know, and, and kind of just be a power of a power guy in the slot. And I think Buffalo did a really good job of, you know, he's not a guy who's going to win underneath like a Cole Beasley. He's not a guy who's going to win with these really intricate routes. But what Buffalo did said, okay, that's fine. You're not, you're not the loosest in the hip guy. You're not the, you're not going to be the, so you don't really have the skill set to be this elite route runner. Okay. We're going to put you on the outside. We're going to have you run posts. We're going to have you run corner routes. We're going to have you run digs. We're going to have you run overs. We're not going to have you do this super intricate stuff because that's what you're good at. So I think he's really suited to be a five, six, maybe 700 yard a year guy as a wide receiver three. But I think there's a reason he didn't produce a ton with John Brown out of the lineup. Cause I don't think he's really suited to be that wide receiver two role. So I think he comes in and he has a very similar year to his rookie year in terms of production, stuff like that. But I just don't think he's going to be this 1000 yard a year guy who's going to take another massive jump. I think his ceiling is pretty close to what we saw in 2020. I think that's totally fair for sure. Um, I think that, you know, you can, there's definitely reason to be excited about him. There's no question. He, he, he could play in this league. He'd be a productive player in this league. And he does bring something to the table, which the bills don't have, which is that down the field, you know, vertical size that he has. Um, but like you said, though, there's now a lot of, there's a whole year of film on him. Um, and at the end of the day, the Bills brought in Emmanuel Sanders probably for a reason. They probably aren't ready to put him in that wide receiver three role quite yet. So yeah, I agree. As much as there's a lot of excitement around him, as there should be, he gave he showed a lot as a rookie, a lot to get excited about. Um, you know, this isn't a guy who, you know, I don't think this is a guy you could sit here and say he's going to be a superstar year two, which some fans I think kind of maybe have that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of idea for him. So for my guy, though, that I think... Oh, no, you can go, go ahead. I was, and I was going to say, that's okay. Like, it's okay to not... Mm -hmm. Not not every guy on every roster is a 1,000-yard-a-year stud. It's okay if he's a guy who's going to be your third option, fourth option, and gives you 500 yards. Like, you need that kind of guy. You need someone who is only... You, you need those... You need role players. And I think he's a really, really good role player. I just don't think he's an alpha-type wide receiver. No, definitely for sure. And again, he's got a role in this team, and 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 that's what it is. So for for my guy that I think is going to disappoint this, you know, with the season, you know, I, I thought about it for a while. And this might be, uh, I think this is one that's that's. And I'm not I'm not I'm not hoping this happens, but I'll explain it myself, I guess. But I'm going to go with Daryl Williams, and I'm not saying that I think he's going to fall off a cliff, kind of like what we saw in Carolina. Um, but this is a guy that. It, throughout his career, he's been inconsistent. He's been injured. He's been put out of position. And yes, he's coming off a great season, but he's got some big expectations now. He got paid this offseason. And of course, I hope for the Bills' sake that this isn't true, but I still have some concerns. I, I knew the Bills had to sign him. There's no question. After the year he had, they had to re-sign him. But this is not a guy who has been a top-tier right tackle in the game year in, year out for several years. This is a guy who's had two great seasons and a couple kind of not so good ones. So 
I think that, you know, I kind of need to see it again before I'm all in on Daryl Williams. And I think that this is, you know, a guy who can really be the anchor on the right side of the offensive line. Because like I said, the consistency has not been there at any point in his career. And if we're going off what happened with him in Carolina, I mean, he had that all pro year in 17 and then 18, 19, he was injured and played terribly. So, um, you know, that, that he's a guy that I am just not quite ready to fully believe is that top notch right tackle that he showed in 2020, just because he hasn't done it in consecutive years in his career to this point. If Pierre is listening to this, his ears just perked up because he, you know, we had the whole back and forth with him about, uh, can Spencer Brown take that job? So, you know, I, I guess my question for you is, is, do you think he's the guy who who's, is a threat for losing that starting job? Or do you think we're just going to kind of be really frustrated with him all year along that, that right tackle spot? I don't think he loses the job because McDermott's all about the rookies earning it. And this is a veteran who McDermott trusts. And again, I, I'm not saying that I full heartedly, you know, believe and obviously hope that Darrell Williams you know, falters big time in this season. But I think I'm more trying to say is that, you know, this is a guy that hasn't been consistent in his career. And I, I just don't think you could say he's a shoe in in 21 to play at that elite level. We saw him in 2020. I think that he can, I think it's possible, but I'm not ready to book it that Darrell Williams is going to be an elite right tackle just because again, like I've said, he hasn't done it back to back years yet. It's been a kind of one year here and there sort of a thing for Daryl. Um, so do I think Spencer Brown takes it week one? I don't think so at all. Now let's say that Darrell Williams struggles throughout the season and Spencer Brown shows some flashes. It could kind of be what happened with Deion Dawkins a little bit with Cordy Glenn, where Cordy Glenn got hurt. Dawkins came in, played at a high level and kind of never looks back. I could maybe see something like that happening. Uh, because again, like I said, Derrick Williams does have a pretty lengthy injury history. Uh, so that's more, I think, what I'm saying is I'm not guaranteeing that Derrick Williams is going to lose that starting role, is going to be kind of a problem on the O-line for him, but that rather I think that he is someone that, you know, is a little inconsistent. We just don't know quite yet if he's that elite level right tackle, uh, you know, that he was in 2020. And I think that's fair. I, I think it's fair to question a guy you know, and and I I met when when we when when Pierre put out that video, I met him halfway. I think it's fair to question, and Casey's been calling this out too of the Nat no, Buffalo podcast that you know it. I I think maybe more so than other guys, it's a possibility that he quote turns back into a pumpkin, um, because of that lack of consistency and a guy who has an injury history and and stuff like that. And he's not a guy after this year that's super hard to get out of anyways. So I if if uh, he's not playing well, yeah, there's, I think there's absolutely a chance that, you know, Buffalo checks out their options. Um, so I, I, I like that point. Uh, you know, I, I think Spencer Brown's a really exciting prospect that they have behind him and a guy they uh, a guy that they like. So it, I think it'll be a really interesting to watch as the season goes on. For sure. So let's go to this next question. I think this is a very interesting question from our friend uh, Bill's Reddit. He very active listener and follower, so we always uh, love what he has to put on Twitter. Uh, but uh, Bill's Reddit asks, you know, what do Brian Dable and Leslie Frazier need to do this season to seal the deal on a head coaching gig? And I'll start with Leslie Frazier. To be honest, and I do hate to say this, I don't know if Leslie Frazier is going to get another shot at a head coaching gig. And this isn't to say I don't think he's qualified, because I think he's plenty qualified. But as we've seen throughout the league, this craze of finding the young, innovative offensive mind has really kind of gone bananas. And Leslie Frazier's a guy, he's he's been around, he's defensive guy. And let's face it, at the end of the day, he only had one head coaching interview the entire offseason after, you know, having consecutive years of a top ten defense. So I, I don't know if Leslie Frazier will ever get that chance. And I, I believe he you know, he, he should, he's more than capable of being a head, a head coach and a, and a pretty damn good one, but he did have a chance in Minnesota. It didn't go great. I just think that he's that window for him. Like we've talked a lot about Super Bowl windows Well, for coaching. I think there is a head coaching window and I think it kind of shut for Leslie Frazier. Now for, for Brian Dable, you know, if the bills offense continues to be electric, like it was last year. And if Josh Allen continues this MVP, pace that he's on 
I think he's gone after next uh, season. If the Bills offense continues this this level, because he already had a lot of attention as it is. And again, if the Bills have another deep playoff run, another great season on their on, on that side of the ball, I think Brian Dable is as good as gone. Yeah, I'll start with Frazier like you did, you know, and and I think like, you know, I, I debated whether putting this note in here, but I will because I think it's a very real thing. It's hard for black coaches to get jobs in the NFL. And that's not a that's not, if you're listening to this, I don't know if you want to hear or not, but it, it's the way it is. And it's an issue in the NFL. And guys more uh qualified than Leslie Frazier aren't getting jobs, like Eric the enemy. So that's a very real issue. Um I, I won't sit on that one too long. But I think part of it, like you said, he's 62. I think part of it is that this isn't his defense. This is a Sean McDermott defense. And yes, he's the play caller, but he's had the play calls taken from him a couple of times. Um We've seen older defensive coaches get jobs like Vic Fangio, but not quite the, uh, you know, I think the defenses he was running were his defenses. And um, no, I, I think that it's a, a lot harder for him to get a job and it's going to take a situation where Houston, where no one really wants to go to Houston, the coach to, for him to find his jobs. And, you know, he's had a head coaching stint that didn't end up going that well for him. Who I think he got fired in the middle of his third season. So yeah, he has that all going against him. Now, does he deserve it? Probably, right? You would think you would want someone who's had a, a right hand seat to um to this rebuilding process. But I, I just think with the way the NFL is going, it, it'll just be really, really hard for him to land that job. Um as for Brian Dable, I jokingly have in my notes. Part of it might be just not going as far in the playoffs. If he if they don't lose that Baltimore game, I, maybe he's the San Diego car. San Diego, holy crap, the LA coach right now. Um, but you would think, I mean, he's a popular guy. I, I think some things to remember about Brian Dable is he had a couple not good stints in his career. He had a couple. Um, he was in. Cleveland with Brady Quinn and a really bad and a really bad Browns team. So he has some history of not. He has two years of not stellar offenses in Buffalo. So I think maybe there's some linger, lingering anxiety around that. How much of this was a flash in the pan year? Whether that's a fair assessment or not. And um, so I think there's that. But I think if you have another top ten year offense for Brian Dable, and Josh has another MVP type season or top five season. He's going to be a Shanahanian type hype coach coming out, and he's going to be able to go wherever he wants, and someone will wait for him. And the, you know, I, I think part of it with this year too is, you know, I wonder how many teams are um, nervous about the member. Remember what happened with Josh McDaniels in, in Indianapolis a couple of years ago? Yep. Yep. I do. Yeah, so you know, I could a guy do they don't they might not want a guy who, you know, they might want to try to avoid a situation where you hire all of a guy's assistants, you wait all off season, and then they say, eh, screw it, and don't go to you. So I think there's some of that too, and that's why Buffalo pushed for that rule in the in the owners' meetings this off season that, um, that they want coaches to, uh you want teams to wait to hire guys till after the season. So, you know, th that was a lot of information I just gave you, but I, I think Dable's got the clearer path than Leslie Frazier at this point. No, no, I think, I think those are all fair points. And absolutely. I think there's no question that Dable has the clear path to a job. And again, it's, it's tough to, you know, like you, like you said with, with, with Leslie Frazier, you know, there's a lot of things going against him, unfortunately. And, and some of it's really, a lot of it's out of his control. Um, so, but that was a good question from Bill's Reddit. Uh, and definitely a question that, you know, I think was it was interesting to definitely talk about. So Zach, our friend from uh, BF here, uh, another avid listener of the show. So shout out to Zach. He asked us, which UDFA makes the roster? Ryan, who do you think out of these UDFAs? Because this is now a tough roster for veterans who have been around to make. And UDFAs is always a challenge. But which UDFA do you see on the Bills roster come week one? I think I have in my notes I have Warren none other than Warren G son oh July Griffin as my one UDFA who I think really has a chance to make the roster. 
I think when you look at the depth of the position and you look at the type of player Ojolai Griffin is and the guy who I think has a unique skill set in the fact that he can play press coverage probably more so than Dane Jackson or Levi Wallace. Not to, that he can take their job, but has a unique skill set. A guy who, had he not been injured, had he not gotten COVID during the draft process, maybe gets drafted higher than, you know, you know, there was I've seen people who had, you know, fourth fifth round grades on a guy like Old July. And a guy a position that's just not deep right now. And, you know, Wild Goose can be, you know, I think Wild Goose is someone who I think maybe more of a slot. Uh, option at this point you know maybe and so i think a guy is a it at the outside corner spot which is uh which really is not deep at this point in a in a position that you know mcdermott has shown that he's willing to give low end undrafted free agent guys run i think he's a guy that i'm really looking forward to seeing his development during camp it's funny because I feel like you and me often have the very same line of thought because that's also who I had down. But I'll go with my second option, not to uh, kind of say the exact same thing here. But yeah, I do agree. I think I think Ojale Griffin has got the clearest path of, of, out of any UDFA to make the roster. So just for the sake of not being repetitive here, I'm going to go with my guy. I've sent him all off season, and I'm going to stick with him. I'm sure fans are sick and tired of me saying this kid's name. But Tarek Thompson from San Diego State, I think has got a shot. And once again, he's got versatility, which you know McDermott and company love that out of their DBs. He can play inside a nickel. He can be, you know, a safety on the back end of the defense. And this is a guy that has kind of special teams just written all over him. He's a tough little, he's a tough dude. He's, he plays bigger than his size. He's, you know, a smart player. He just strikes me as, a, as again, as a, as a guy that McDermott would totally fall for during the training camp and the preseason process. And the safety depth, although Hyde and Poyer aren't going anywhere, you know, it's a little up in the air. And sometimes the Bills have kept five safeties before. And right now, the only backup safety that's a lock to make this roster is Jaquan Johnson. I mean, DeMar Hamill is a guy I really do like, and I think he could be a nice player for him. You know, we he's also a rookie as well and a, and a sixth-round pick, so it's not like he's got a huge leg up, leg up on, on, on Tarek Thompson. So I think that he's got a possibility to stick on this roster. But I do want to say, you know, I mentioned it before we got into this, but this Bills roster is so ta- so darn talented. It's going to be hard for any of these UDFAs to make it. I think that you can expect probably most of them to be on the practice squad. But if I had to pick one, I think I'm going to go with Tarek Thompson. I was going to put Tarek Thompson in my notes, but I didn't. I I would thought you might take him, but you know, and I think, but I think that's what you got to look at when you look at guys who have a real shot at making this roster from undrafted spots. And you got to look at spots that aren't that deep. And, you know, Jaquan Johnson, yeah, he's good at special teams, but is Buffalo seen enough of a guy? Do they not, you know, if if he's not a guy that they don't foresee playing safety, is that a guy they could move on from? You know, you look at, you know, Damar Hamlin, yeah, he kind of fits into that Dean Marlowe role, but who says Tariq, you know, Tariq Thompson's a guy who probably had, I mean, just as much draft hype as, Demar Hamlin coming out, and you know that was a guy we talked about drafting in some of our draft shows in Tariq Thompson. So I really like that. And you know, you look around the roster, and you know, wh- why are we not saying some of these other guys the Bills have out there? There's not a lot of other spots to be had. Like, there's not room on the offensive line. There's not lo- room in the wide receivers. You know, the only other guy that I could really think of, and you know, it- it's fitting that Zach asked this question of us is Quinton Morris from Bowling Green. Who's uh, who's the tight end because the, the tight end isn't really set up. Isn't really that deep. So could a guy like that take a Tommy Sweeney job or could they roll out with four tight ends like they sometimes do? So, you know, those are, but at the end of the day, it's really just safety and it's really just cornerback that I think really has a shot of someone coming in and, and taking a job as an undrafted free agent. No, I agree. And, and Quentin Morris was the only other name that I did throw around. It was really just those three. Um, and like you said, it's because there's what where what other positions these guys fit in. The Bills just drafted, you know, they've drafted three defensive ends the last two years in the first two rounds of the draft. So you know BN and in general the D line has just got a lot of bodies. The linebacker room's pretty good. The whole offense side of the ball, it's on a tie end, is deep or has lots of assets invested into it already. The, 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 but you know that McDermott 
and, and Bean aren't going to move on from for, for a UDFA. So, you know, those three positions are really the only areas where, like you said, a UDFA has the slight chance of making it. And that's why, like as I've said, you know, these guys are probably going to be practice squad guys and developmental pieces. And we've seen guys like Ike Bucker, right, stick around in the practice squad for year and year out as a UDFA. And now he's a guy that maybe makes his roster. I think that for a lot of these guys, that's kind of the path they'll be on. But I think the three names that we that we said, which is Morris, Griffin, and Thompson, to me, struck me as the three guys that have the likeliest chance of making this roster. But it's but but they have a lot of work ahead of them, and it's not going to be easy um, at all. So we have another question here from Bill's Reddit, uh, who's who's given us some great questions. And this is another interesting one, and we can maybe expand this just in general, the roster as a whole. But he asked, "What will the offensive line look like in 2023?" Uh, but we can also discuss other rooms as a whole because this is going to be, you know, what, what does this roster look like two years from now? Uh, and I guess I'll start here with this. Uh, I'll start with the first the O-line and kind of expand from there. The only guy in the offensive line that at this point will 100% undeniably be on this roster in 2023 and be a starter, I think, is Deion Dawkins. I think outside of Deion, you know, everyone's a who knows. You know, Mitch Morris is a guy that people even talked about him the Bills moving on from him this offseason, and he's somebody that is getting a little older, a little expensive, maybe not, you know, maybe a little overpaid. I mentioned with Daryl Williams, you know, John Feliciano is a guy that, you know, Ryan, you 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 said maybe the Bills should even move on from him. We still don't know if Cody Ford is a starter, really, even in the NFL at this point. So I think outside of Deion Dawkins, and I guess probably Spencer Brown, because that's a third round pick, you're not moving on from him in three years. Um I don't know which guys are going to really be still on this roster. It could be a very different offensive line two, three years from now, especially once Josh Allen inevitably gets this, you know, 40 plus million dollar deal we've been talking about seemingly for, for months because that's going to affect every single area of the football team and the assets and money you could put into that. So, and, and I guess you would kind of say that really with every room. I mean, there's only a handful of guys I look at and confidently say they'll be here in two years. And this isn't, a knock on how the Bills have built this thing, but you know, they have some veterans on the roster that are getting, you know, towards the end of their contracts, getting a little bit older and the Bills are going to have to make some tough cap decisions ultimately once they pay Josh Allen. So as a whole, I think this team, you know, cause I don't want to go into every single player who, who I think is going to be on this roster in you know, two, three years from now, cause I think we'll be here all night. But I think that there's only a handful of guys that I can confidently say are, truly a part of the long-term vision uh, for the Bills, you know, for the, for the Bills, you know, outside of even just the offensive line room. Yeah. And then I think it really gets into our discussion a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about windows that now that Josh Allen is going to be a very expensive quarterback, you need to find cheap talent. So if Buffalo can find, if Spencer Brown can be a starting caliber right tackle, for the next four years, that's striking gold. That keeps your window open, right? If they can find, if if Jake Ganders can come in in two years and be a starting caliber guard, that is gold. That's how you keep your window open there. You know, if, if they can draft someone next year who can take Mitch Morris's job, same idea. Finding cheap talent. That's why the only you're, you you you're dead on. The only guy who is a lock here is Deion Dawkins because you don't let starting caliber left tackles leave you just don't that's not how you win and he is a top 10 top 15 at worst left tackle besides that you know i don't know how many if you can really afford to get locked down to anyone at this point once you hit that second quarterback contract you always have to be trying to find cost effective options and if you can find cost effective options at premium positions and that's why we talk about with this draft it's not just quarterbacks we you, you could where finding cheap talent matters it's stuff like edge rusher stuff like tackle you know guys who are going to get on the open market if they're good 10 15 million dollars finding cost effective options are important so i i really think you know you hit the nail on the head in terms of offensive line you have spent. You have Darrell Williams. Or sorry, not Darrell Williams. You have Deion Dawkins. You have Spencer Brown. If he can be that guy that I think we all think he can be, he has the physical tools to be. So, um, in terms of other positions, you know, I think, and even on this roster, I mean, you want to really go three years down the road, and we won't go to everyone, but 
I think the only people in three years really locked to be on this roster is a guy like Trey White and Josh Allen. And besides that, you know, it's it's why sticking, you know, and this is now it's become a draft conversation, but you know, it's why sticking to your board matters above all else. And and that because you never know what you're gonna need, and you're ultimately gonna end up flipping your roster every few years, anyways. So I don't think in 2023 there's a whole ton of people that really are safe. Oh, and Stefan Diggs. Right. Yeah, no, no. I mean, you're, you're, you're spot on with that. And like you said that, that, you know, championship windows in order, as you said, in order to prolong them, you have to draft well. And the, as we said, the reason why the bills are in this championship window is although they do have a lot of young talent, that's going to be around here. You know, like a guy like Matt Milano, someone I don't think is going anywhere in three years, but how about a guy like Jerry Hughes? Jerry Hughes is not going to be here three years, plain and simple. Like he's, He's probably going to retire or move on. Something like that will happen, and that's just kind of natural. That's what happens, uh, you know, when you're building a team at th- this point in a build for for a roster. So, uh, but to specifically, yeah, but but good question from Bills right once again, and you know, it's going to be fascinating for sure as this thing continues, as this team continues to kind of be in this, you know, unfamiliar territory for us fans of championship windows and paying a quarterback and all this. You know, as I've said, we're going to really find out. I think top notch how how creative uh, Brandon Bean can be with his roster management and how you know top notch of a coach Sean McDermott is. And this isn't taking away anything from them too, because they're for sure top ten at each of their you know respective um, titles at coaching and and, and 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 general manager. But you know building a team and, and, and is one thing, but keeping it going is another. So we'll find out. But good question from Bill's Reddit. So now we're gonna go to uh, Dominic B. I'm sorry, Dominic. I don't think I could. I don't want to mispronounce your last name, so I'm just going to call you Dominic V. So, yeah, we apologize for that. But he has a good question here, an interesting one. He said, who will be second in receptions and catches? I believe it was Cole Beasley in both these categories uh, this past season. Uh, Ryan, is there someone you think, you know, is it going to be Cole Beasley again? Or is is, is potentially a different name going to be that guy behind Stephon Dix? I think it's got to be Cole Beasley. I I don't think that there's really a running back on this roster that can take that spot. And I, I think the ability Cole Beasley has to a have a chemistry with Josh Allen. So when, you know, when he gets out of the pocket off schedule to get back to the ball, to find holes in, in defenses and to know when to sit, to know when to run. It, I think is an elite talent in that he has. And, and I really makes him special and a unique player in the NFL. And it, I, I think when you look at the way Josh Allen wants to play, Josh Allen's not a guy who wants to check it down. He's one of the lowest rates of check downs, quote unquote, in the NFL. So you, you look at a guy who, you know, maybe Kobe's is a check down because he's running open seven yards down the field on a lot of those plays that, you know, so I, I think a guy that allows Josh Allen to maybe extend those plays because you know Cole Beasley is going to get open and can be that safety blanket. And I really think that's what he is. He's a safety blanket in this offense for Josh Allen. And in the last, really, it's been a year and a half that he's really started coming through as that, as that type of player that whenever those plays seem to break down, whenever he, Josh Allen's doing scam, scam, scramble drill type stuff, Cole Beasley is there. And just, I don't see his role diminishing in this offense barring injuries. Yeah, not to be boring here, but it's, I, I agree. I think it's got to be Cole Beasley. The only guy, the only guy I think could maybe overtake Cole Beasley could be Emmanuel Sanders just because his playing style is kind of an in-between of Cole Beasley and Stefan Diggs. And you know he'll fit in with the offense. He could play you know, inside-outside. And he's a guy that has been known to not only get separation, but really great at you know, simply holding on to the football, catching it. Um, but I agree. I think Cole Beasley, and we saw it this season we kind of saw it in 2019 a little bit you know people talk about josh allen oh the slot those short quick routes that's not his game but cole beasley has made that a huge part of the offense and how many times ryan did it feel like it was you know first and ten maybe something quick over the middle to beasley for seven to nine yards just so easily and and i think that as long as beasley's healthy that is going to continue to be such a huge part of the offense because brian dable makes that slot receiver position a tr- you know a big responsibility and a big role in the offense he has for the last several years now so i agree not, not again i know it's kind of the, the 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 boring take to go with the guy who was you know second receptions and catches last year but i just don't see 
Gabe Davis being that guy, you're definitely not going to get out of out, out of Dawson Knox or whoever's lining up a tight end, even if they make a move for a Zach Ertz. Zach Ertz is not going to be second reception yards on this team. It's just I think the tight end is not the biggest role in this offense. So I agree. I think Cole Beasley uh, for me is definitely that second receiver uh, with the re- with receptions and yards uh, on this football team. Yeah, and and you know so the, some of those slot stuff, some of the, even the design stuff to him. A lot of stuff is designed to him, and some of it's just indefensible. Like with the way modern football is played, you just can't. He his get off and his his little shimmies and almost like Stevie Johnson esque uh, ways that he can beat a defender off the line. It, it's just indefensible, and you know he's been healthy. You know, barring the you know he had the freak kept the freak injury where he broke his whatever this off season or th- in the week 17. But you know, it, it's, it's, I don't think, I think it's a skill that's really going to age well the next couple of years too. I don't think it's something that he's going to lose going forward. Absolutely. So uh, this next question comes from John, AKA actually my dad, he wanted to get on the conversation. So shout out to my dad, John. So he asked us two questions. One's bills related. One's just kind of a fun question, but we'll go with the, with this Bill's question. So he says, I still feel a bit uncomfortable thinking of Tyler Bass at crunch time. Am I, you know, should I be worried? Am I crazy? What do you guys think? And, you know, Tyler Bass, he's, he's young. So it is tough to say, but aside from those little, you know, those shaky moments early in the season, I think back to, you know, those two jets games where he missed a couple kicks, but Tyler Bass was rock silent. And not to mention, made some monstrous kicks in the playoffs. I mean, I think people forget he that 54 yard he had against the Colts, which effectively kind of won the game when it was all said and done because the Bills, you know, when it, you know, ended up only winning by three. I mean, that was a big time crunch time kick. You doesn't get much bigger than that in the playoffs. And he nailed it right down the middle. That thing would have been good from 64. So am I concerned? Not really. I mean, of course he's young, so you're always gonna, you know, you need to see it to believe it, but he made some big prime time clutch kicks for this football team throughout the season when they needed it. Uh, and, and he's a confident kid. He's always been in college. So I personally am not so concerned about Tyler Bass. I, I believe in him when it's big time moment, end of the game, he can come through for you. It's really funny that, that your dad had this question. Cause I have a buddy of mine that ever since those first couple of Tyler Bass games was texting me every week, cut Tyler Bass, cut Tyler Bass, cut Tyler Bass. And ever since that, the game that really stuck out, I think I think the game-changing game for him was that Jets game where he had to kick eight field goals, and I think made six of them. But that Arizona game is where I felt fun, where where it was kind of the tipping point for me in terms of he had those three 50-yard kicks, I think, at the end of the half or splitting the half or whatever it was, but had those monstrous just, you know, huge kicks. And, you know, you talk about that Colts game, the 54 54- yarder in january which is exactly you know we always talk about with kickers and punters and quarterbacks here right it's can can you throw the ball can you kick the ball in buffalo in january and he has that power um you know i I think your dad's uh concern is valid in the fact that it is one year he did have a slow start and but i think what he has going for him is it is an upward trajectory his career he his this back half of the year he finished on an upward trajectory. He, you know, it, and I, you know, I don't think he's not going to lose leg strength. He can kick it from anywhere. You know, I'm waiting for the day that McDermott rolls him out for a 65 yard kick at the end of the half to see if he can break the NFL record. And so, you know, I, 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 for me, it's hard to hate Tyler Bass. I understand the anxiety. I think it's fair to say, hey, let's see another year of this. I think the same way that we want to see Josh Allen have another year of this type of production. So it's fair. I understand it. I, I think there's always a certain amount of anxiety that comes with kickers unless you're playing against uh, Justin Tucker. Like, there's always going to be anxiety with kickers in the NFL, I think. For sure. And, and, and you know, he had big shoes to fill. I mean, Steven Hauschka was a clutch kicker, I don't, you know, and had a big leg. So, you know, that's not, you know, those are so tough shoes to fill from a veteran that was kind of beloved by the fan base a little bit too. Um, but, like you said, though, Tyler Bass, I mean, he, he he's on tra- trajectory, to be honest, where, like, if he keeps us up and and, pl- and and if he continues playing the way how he did at the end of the season and kicking, making those clutch kicks and being pretty darn accurate, too, 
mind you, with that big of a leg, I mean, we could be talking about one of the better kickers in the NFL if if this is who he is because some of those kicks he made, like like you said, at the end of the season, I mean, you know, what other kickers are making those kicks outside of maybe him and like a Justin Tucker, you know, not too many. So uh, I, I think that it's understandable to have some concerns, but I, I, I personally am not concerned about him. Um, he asked now a second question. This one's kind of fun for some 585ers here. I uh, said, what is the best concession stand at Frontier Field and what beer should be consumed at a Red Wings game? Both very important questions, especially yeah. now with the nice weather, things getting back to normal uh, in, you know, in Western New York. Uh, so, Ryan, I'm curious, what, what, you know, what's your go to beer and what's your go to food when you're at Frontier Field? I like the uh, I don't know what concessions. I haven't been to a Red Wings game in two years now, but whatever one has those little mini garbage plate cans. I really enjoy. That's my favorite one. Those little mini garbage plates. And I should have known. <laughs> for my beer, I had to go with. There's the there's that concession stand now. It has all those really. That has like they have like a craft beer concession stand in the right. I think down the right field line now. But if, if push comes to shove, and this is really true about anywhere in Rochester, uh, a good three heads, the kind, a ri- original IPA, I think is. Is an unbeatable Rochester summer beer. I don't think there's you, you can. I don't. You, it's always great. You can never go wrong with that. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to go with a three heads, the kind IPA for my for my Red Wings beer. Those are both great picks, and I can't I can't disagree with that. I should have known that the garbage plate enthusiast would of course pick <laughs> the garbage plate. For me, my go to food I always go either Black Angus, uh, which is a one of the concession stands. I believe it's down the. Uh, first baseline, kind of towards the end of the stadium, but they do like burgers and cheesesteaks and sandwiches, and it's honestly a pretty top-notch burger. It's and it's a hefty burger. I think it's a half-pound patty. So, uh, and it's like you know Angus beef. So it, it's 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 like for real. Um, and then for beer, I mean, I just you know became legal uh, last summer, so I didn't. I've not gotten to experience a lot of drinking beer at baseball games, uh, unfortunately, but. Uh, you know, you can't go wrong, I feel like, with a Jenny Light. It's just such a Rochester classic uh, in the sun. It's pretty cool, refreshing, you know, while you're sitting there watching some some ball. So I'm going to go Jenny Light and uh, a Black Angus Burger uh, are probably my my go-tos when I'm at Frontier Field. But honestly, the food at Frontier Field is quite good. You really can't go wrong. I think it was actually voted one of the best, uh, some of the best concession stands of anywhere in the minor leagues. So a little fun fact there. Uh, next time you're there, you can't really go wrong with anything uh, at Frontier Field. But this next question comes from Clay, specifically to me. Uh, and but Ryan, if you want to chime in on this, of course, I mean, you know, feel free. But he he asked uh, at Mitch, he said, "What Penn State player would you add to the Bills?" Name, you know, and then he also wants us to name all the drought QBs, which I guess the two of us can can try to do that uh, in a minute here. But to answer his question about Penn State players. I assume he's probably means you know which which current Penn State players, not guys that are currently in the pros. Um, I'll say he. I don't know where he's going to go in the draft, but for those who don't know, Jahan Dotson, definitely check him out. He led the Big Ten rece- rece- receptions and receiving yards this past year. He's very much the kind of player the Bills like. He honestly does remind me a lot of Emmanuel Sanders, where although he's not the biggest guy, great route runner, very good hands. He he. He makes some big time catches for a guy his size. I mean, really can go up and get it. Um, and a beloved player on the team. All the guys love him. He's kind of a processy dude. Uh, so I think Jahan Dotson, he, he has got some ridiculous highlights this past season. Um, so that's my guy that I think uh, the Bill should have. Um, I don't know, Ryan, if you have any, if you know too much about Penn State, if you want to toss in a name here. But if not, we can go right into trying to name some drought QBs. I did no research for this question, to be honest. I, so I'm just going to throw out Paul Puz Leslie because he was already a bill and I really liked him. And I still, I, I have a jersey with his autograph in my closet. So my, my, uh, I'm going to go Paul Puz Leslie because he was already a bill. Can't go wrong with Puz. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's beloved by Bills fans and beloved by Penn State guys uh, as well. But name all the drought QBs. I don't think I can possibly do that. But I could certainly, I think this, I, I, I think because we'll be here all night because there's been just so many quarterbacks. But how about this, Ryan? Top three favorite quarterbacks are in the drought. Oh, top three favorite. Okay. Uh, number one for me is Tyrod. I adore Tyrod. I always made a joke that I would name a dog after Tyrod. Whatever quarterback, whatever quarterback made the draft, 
or made the playoffs for the Bills, I would either name a pet or a child after them. <laughs> um, my better half did not allow me to name my dog Tyrod, so maybe my first child I can name him Tyrod. Um, but Tyrod is number one. I love Tyrod. He's got. I love his style. I love the way. Yeah, I love the way he played. You know, it, he he kind of became a lot more conservative towards the end of his career. But I love Tyrod. Um, you know, I grew up on Fitzpatrick. Uh, he's a fun dude. I, I, um, he's played better football since he's left Buffalo, but a guy who really embraced Buffalo and I think he gave us a lot of highlights. And I think my third, I would have to go, go with. I never really thought about a third. They all kind of stunk. Um, I'll say Trent Edwards. Trent Edwards, I think, was really the when I really first started watching football and when I really got into watching the bills, Trent Edwards was when I started, like when I started watching football every Sunday, Trent Edwards was the quarterback. I, I watched some during JP Lossman. That's when I was coming up and I was a little bit young still, but Trent Edwards, before he got wrecked in that Arizona Cardinals game back in whatever year it was, he was not a terrible quarterback. Um, and, you know, I, I remember when he had that 5-2 start or whatever it was. And I, you know, I, I, I enjoyed the way he played. And he obviously didn't pan out. But I'll go Trent Edwards as my third. I like those picks. Those are all good. Um, I will say about Trent Edwards, it's funny because I think when you look back, I actually really dissect. Um, and I don't want I know it, it, football is not strictly stats. But uh, I, I was curious one day. I looked back and looked through some of his old game logs. You know, Trent Edwards, I think, was a was a was not a bad quarterback for the Bills. It's just funny because I remember at the time that was right when I was you know I was young. I was probably you know maybe eight years old uh, during hit that time, and that was when I was starting to really like love the Bills and get into it. And I remember the hype, like everyone thought that he was the franchise. If you look back at his stats, you kind of realize it was a little you know misguided, misled because you know he wasn't tearing teams up really all that much. But uh, but definitely a, a good pick there. Um, I guess for mine, I'm, I'm going to go with Fitz as well. And Fitz, Fitz Magic, that 5-2 and two start the Bills had, I think, in 2011. I mean, that was just so fun. Even that season just took it such a nosedive so rapidly. But, like, those first seven weeks, I mean, Fitzpatrick was playing some awesome football. And, like, the Bills were entertaining on offense for once. And, you know, him and Stevie were just on such a – had such a connection. Uh, so that was always fun. And, and like you said, Fitzpatrick, he embraced Buffalo. He – knowing him now – he is, he was such a fit for the fan base, really in particular too. He's such a fun guy, such a gritty dude, and the whole story, the Harvard thing. I know it gets overplayed, and oh, you know everyone makes fun of. Oh, you know he went to Harvard, but that will forever be so cool that he was a a Harvard graduate playing the NFL. Um, for my number two, I'm gonna go Kyle Orton. Might be a little off, a little, a little unusual there, but not the best looking dude to say the least. Kind of a funny guy, uh, but honestly though, Kyle Orton was a lot better than I think we kind of thought. I mean, had he played 16 games, he would have been a 4,000-yard passer that season. I mean, he was on pace to really you know, put up some good numbers, and I think we could say, had he probably played all 16 games, that that Bills team would have been a playoff team for sure, because they almost were with him coming in in Week 5. Uh, and again, he was he was like one of the more competent quarterbacks during the drought era, for sure. And, and it, you know, the Bills were entertaining that year. Um I can't say Drew Bledsoe just because, uh, you know, he was kind of before my time. But I think my next one, oof, who would I pick? I'll go with Tyrod as well. Um, specifically 2015 Tyrod. That, I, I loved Tyrod after that year. I did really think that the Bills maybe had like a total, you know, gem in Tyrod that everyone just didn't see coming that or whatever. That offense was good. That, that offense tw- was objectively that 20, good. That 2015, team, that 2015 uh, offense, I think they were ranked like 13th in the NFL. I mean... You know, it was like the best right offense they had up until, you know, I guess I guess this past season. That was the, one of the better offenses I've seen the Bills have. I mean, and, and they were like a legit, like, you know, he was kind of a weapon. Like there was, you know, his his running ability and his deep ball was like for real, you know. And he and Sammy Watkins, they went on, I mean, there was like an eight, nine week stretch where they were like one of the most dynamic QB wide receiver duos in the NFL. They were torching people. So like. Yeah, I think Tyrod, you're right. You know, towards the end, he he was, I mean, I'll, I'll just say in 27 or 2019 or no, 2017, you know, he was bad at times. I mean, flat out, not good. But I think people forget, you know, that Tyrod was sort of dynamic and he was, I think, 
him and Fitzpatrick and Drew Bledsoe, to me, talent-wise, I think you probably could argue were the, the, the very best of the best the Bills had a quarterback during the draft era. Yep. Um, and the, I, I, I want to put Kyle Orton in there, but I didn't want to just go with the three most recent quarterbacks. And I think what I really enjoyed about uh, Kyle Orton, I always respect him for, was the way he retired. And just, I, if you guys haven't, if you guys don't remember the story, is that he went back and uh, he, he w- there was end of, it was the end of the season interviews and reporters were at his locker and they, were, they asked him if he could do a couple questions. And he said, I just got to go grab my wall. I just got to uh, go talk to someone real quick. And then he just never came back, and no one's heard from. Literally, no one's heard from him since. So I'll always love Kyle Orton for the way he retired, and that that 2014 team was fun. Definitely and a good question there from uh, from Clay, because um, it's fun to reminisce about the draft, especially now that the Bills are good. Like I, I find it fun to talk about kind of the dark era of uh, Bills football. And last question here comes from our friend and recent uh, guest on the show, uh, Judge Mathis. The judge asked. What Bills player would you change their number? Kind of a fun question here to end on. So, Ryan, uh, which Bills player would you change the number? And I guess more importantly, which number are you changing it to? So th- this will tie in. I didn't put it in the show notes. This will tie in to the question Brother Bill asked me to why I hate Isaiah McKenzie. And maybe it's partly because of his number. Because I think not enough wide receivers wear a number in the 80s anymore. Randy Moss had an elite. Like 81, 85, those are elite wide receiver numbers. No one uses those. Everyone puts him in the team. Everyone has wide receiver numbers in the teens now. Um, so I would say if Isaiah McKenzie went back to his Denver Broncos number of 84, I think I would have a much more favorable opinion of Isaiah McKenzie. That's a definitely a good pick there. I, I, I'm i trying to think. I haven't put too much thought into this question, um, to be honest. But if I had to pick one, I think they now said that DBs can wear single digits, right? Uh, I think was yes, it? yes. I think so. Yes. Okay. I would like to see a DB. I don't know, maybe who, but it may, may, you know, in a single digit number. I know Hyde. I think Micah Hyde wore number nine at Iowa. That would be kind of fun. Um, because I actually think when DBs, similar receivers, when they're wearing single digit numbers, actually, you know, from the college game, I think it looks kind of cool. Uh, so I wouldn't mind to see a DB wearing a single digit number. Not not the teens, not the teens, but I'm talking like one through nine. Give me a defensive back, you know, press coverage wearing that number. I, I think I could get kind of hyped up about that. Um, but I, I'm trying to think if any of the Bills DBs wore single digits. In co- I think because Trey White wore 18. Uh, yeah, so maybe none of them have, but that would be fun, I think. Yeah, I'm I'm all for if Zach's listening to this podcast, he's going to turn us off right now. Right, he, right. He, he hates he hates the number changes. He hates, he <laughs> hates, I know, he hates the uh, un- the the unnatural number changes but i am all about um players wearing going back i want to see i i love emmanuel sanders wearing number one i love you know i i I think julio jones is wearing number two now in in uh tennessee so i'm about chaos give me more chaos give me guys wearing funky numbers uh i don't care if it makes it harder for offensive line to know who they're supposed to block i think it's fun and uh, you know, give me a punter. Give me some college punters. Like, give give Matt, <laughs> there we go. Give, give me Matt. Make Matt Hat wear Matt Hack wear like ninety seven or something like that. Right. No. No. That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, yeah. You gotta love a good like ninety nine kicker. You know, because that just makes no sense. The only one I don't like is Mac Jones wearing fifty. What the hell's up with that? I don't know. I didn't read. I asked my pa- I asked one of my Patriots fan friends that. Uh, why that's happening. I don't know if that's like a Patriots way thing where it's like, Oh, they got to earn their quarterback number or he's just being, I don't know, but that that's a super weird number, but it's fitting. Cause Mac Jones is going to be terrible. <laughs> hey man. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to say I agree with that statement necessarily, but like, you know, eh, I kind of do. Um, and also Jalen Ramsey, wearing number five, by the way, that's a good example. Want to see something look cool. Jalen Ramsey lined up on a five with the visor and the sleeves and everything. Good luck. Good luck. Um, so anyways, that kind of wraps up. This was fun, actually. Very, very different idea here. Uh, we're glad that, you know, for the fans, you guys got to send us some questions. They were really great. A lot of fun to answer them. And, uh, you know, it was good to give back to you guys because without you guys, hey, the show, you know, wouldn't be where we are. So we're happy. Uh, you guys were very active in sending us some good questions. I guess before we wrap it up, Ryan, any announcements um, about anything coming up? I mean, we're on YouTube now. I guess that's kind of a big deal. Uh, so you can now watch us instead of just listening to us. 
And I think I said in the last episode, our time has changed to noon. Um, anything else? Um, I'm trying to think. I don't think I, uh, I don't think I have anything else for the, if, if we missed any questions, we'll definitely do a mailbag question sometime later in the season. Cause we're going to run out of stuff to talk about at some point. Um, oh yeah. But yeah, watch us on YouTube. Uh, where or keep listening to us here. If you listen to us on podcast platforms, five, eight, five report on Twitter at sports rock on Twitter at Mitch Broder on Twitter and keep interacting with us. Keep enjoying the off season. Keep enjoying the nice weather and uh, the, the training camp will be here before we know it. And we'll have a whole new batch of storylines to talk about. Definitely. Definitely. So uh, that about does it for uh, Ryan Sullivan. I'm Mitch Broder. Thank you so much guys for listening. And we will see you next week.